My name is Jen Wengler, and I am the Vice President of Technology for The Right Place. I'm also the Director of the Technology Council of West Michigan, and it's great to be here today. Um, you have an amazing group panel here today to talk to you, but before we get started, I wanted to recognize the space that we are in. So this is one of Grand Valley's newest buildings. It's called the Center for Interprofessional Health. It's also the home of the Applied Computing Institute. And so Jonathan Inglesma is a dean here today of the Applied Computing Institute. And I know he'll talk a little bit more about the center and some of the really innovative, cool things that you're doing here. But super excited to be back. Um, I wanted to, to spend this morning talking about uh, Grand Rapids and what we are doing kind of in this push to become the next tech hub of the Midwest. So communities all over the country are positioning themselves to be the next innovative center or technology hub of the world. And so over the next 30 to 40 minutes, we're gonna talk a little bit more about how we're doing that here in Grand Rapids. Our business <coughs> research team very early on went on a bit of a virtual journey and they studied cities that were similar in economy to Grand Rapids. And what they found are those cities that had tech as their leading industry, or were even making a push to become the next technology hub, that they were light years ahead of other communities as far as business growth and job creation, and just all of the metrics that make an economy flow. So we're trying to do that here in Grand Rapids, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the things that have bubbled to the surface and the things that are happening to push us forward. And my hope for you today, regardless of where you fall in that pendulum or what you're doing, whether you're a technologist, you're new to the area, or you're an existing resident, that you can see yourself in some of these actionable items and activities that are happening today. So with that, we'll get started. I'm gonna start by providing uh, our panelists an opportunity to talk about themselves and the very cool work that they're doing. And then I'll kick it off with some discussion and some questions for them. I'll open it up to the audience and allow you to ask some questions of them, and then we'll end with a brown bag lunch at the end. So, sound good? Cool. All right, let's kick it off. Bobby, would you take it? Sure, sure. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Bobby Fleischman, Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Ferris State University. And I see we have a colleague here, Jonathan Maroney, Professor Maroney from our Kendall College of Art and Design. And uh, he leads innovation on our campus. And we have some very exciting things going on, including something I'll talk about, and that's our Center for Virtual Learning, uh, which will come online uh, this September. It's a $30 million building that's gonna house our uh, information security, uh, our, uh, our uh, college, uh, school of education, uh, as well as the first uh, eSports uh, dedicated arena in the state of Michigan. A lot of exciting things. We're also going to have our television di digital media program uh, in, in the building as well as uh, the first uh, artificial intelligence program in the state of Michigan. So we're really excited about innovation and uh, having uh, faculty like Professor Maroney uh, and others who are really helping to drive this. Thanks, Bobby. Rob? Uh, so, Rob Yana, Senior Vice President of Business Development at The Right Place. Um, uh, happy to be here uh, in regards to what we do at The Right Place. We're an economic development organization, and we're tasked with building out, helping businesses that are currently here to sustain, to build bigger, uh, or to attract businesses that are not currently here and come into the region. Um, our team is made up of four key work streams. It is business development, uh, it is um, technology, uh, it is manufacturing services, and attraction initiatives to essentially bring uh, companies that are no longer no, not here currently and to attract those into uh, the region. I'm Jonathan Engelsma. I'm uh, part of the co school computing faculty here at Grand Valley. <coughs> And I also serve as director of the Applied Computing Institute, which is actually right here in this building. Jen, thank you for plugging this beautiful facility. But we're actually in the fifth floor here, and if you approach the building from the uh, 
the east, you might have seen this horse up on the patio. And so we're, our office suite is right there. So we always tell our industry partners there's a lot of computing horsepower up there. So when you see that horse, if you haven't come up to see us yet, uh, please do. So the Applied Computing Institute is, uh, is regionally focused and it's an experiential industry sponsored, um, experiential learning industry sponsored platform for all things computing. And it, it originated here in 2018 based on work we've been doing for almost a decade. And um, a lot of our, all of our computing students actually um, interact with industry partners at some point in their academic career. And all those relationships begin in the Applied Computing Institute. Recently, um, we've started to have conversations with some of the other computing <coughs> programs in the area because we're one of the larger programs in computing and we have some scale and we would like to take what we've already built and make it truly a platform, not just for Grand Valley, but for some of the other peer institutions in the area as well. So we've talked to, if, if some of you are out there and you haven't heard from us yet, you're on our list, we've started those conversations. And the other, the other benefit of a platform like that in West Michigan is that it gives the industry partner sort of one place to go to basically start conversations and, and collaborations with faculty and students across West Michigan, not just at Grand Valley. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Dan Chuparkoff. I am a technology leader at Google. I work on Google Cloud technologies for mobile app development. Uh, and I also have a small uh, consulting business called Reinvention Labs where I help teams figure out how to adapt to change and reinvent the way they collaborate uh, so they can be more innovative, lead in their industry. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I'm looking forward to talking with you all today. Thanks, Dan. So um, I mentioned I host a, this technology council. So we are a group 34, 40, something like that. CEOs, CIOs, leading technology organizations all across West Michigan. And so we talk a lot about talent. We talk a lot about innovation and how to do both to, be, to remain competitive. Um, so my first question is Dan. Um, Dan, in the work that you do both at Google and I know you do some other things on the side, what can companies do to continue to be innovative and creative with their teams and help them grow and, and, uh, and, and grow their products? Yeah, I, I, so personally, I, uh, I left a job in Detroit for a job in San Francisco about 12 years ago. And um, I didn't do it for the money. I, sure, I got paid more, but I was also paying like $6,000 a month for my two-bedroom apartment. So like, the, realistically, you're not actually making more money by going to Silicon Valley. But people are going there, and why might that be? Um, I went there because I could learn an amazing amount of stuff. Technology is moving really, really, really rapidly. I went to school like 25 years ago. Like I didn't learn anything then that I still do now. So I needed a mechanism for continuously learning. And I got that by surrounding myself with people that just went to school last week and bosses that have done work for 15 years in technology. And so that ability, the opportunity to continuously learn keep people at your organization. Hiring them is, is another story, and we talked a lot about that in the last hour and a half here. But once you get them, you also need to give them the opportunity to continuously grow and become innovative themselves. That's a really important part about growing a technology hub that has longevity. If people don't have a way of keeping themselves current, learning the new technologies in data science or the new technology innovation in design, like those are the kinds of things that help you stay marketable as a person. And that's a really, really important part to consider. Thank you. So Jonathan, this next question is for you. I know that you know in West Michigan, we have a really strong and vibrant software consultancy base. But our goal is to get out more product and product development, uh, both within our existing companies as well as new companies coming in. ACI has been an amazing asset for us in West Michigan and continues to engage with our businesses around supporting their product development uh, with their student base. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, sure. So, 
in, in ACI, so let me let me just start by pointing out we I believe we have the largest um, group of recent PhDs in computing disciplines within an hour and a half here. Michigan State has a lot, but um, so there's an incredible amount of talent. The unit has grown dramatically in the last five or six years. A lot of these are fresh out PhDs that are very actively doing research. And we're actually hiring in the areas that are starting to trend and become very high demand in the industry. One area in particular is cybersecurity. Um, so we're, we're very conscious of the need out there in the region and we're building out our capabilities in cybersecurity in the form of an undergraduate four-year degree program as well as a two-year master's degree. But we want those programs to be very relevant to the needs of the industry. And so we've got a number of initiatives uh, going on. We're, we're active, first of all, with the different consortiums that, out there that, that are out there active in this space. We hosted the uh, West Michigan Cybersecurity Consortium recently here. Um, and there's also WOMSA, the Women's Security um, Alliance, working in this area as well. And then lastly, MICTRA, Michigan's Cyber Threat Response Alliance, in the partnership with MICTRA has resulted in a cyber threat range right here in this facility that we launched in January. And so this is an air gapped laboratory where our students can go and learn um, about cybersecurity in a, in a very real world environment, but contained so we don't pollute the rest of the network. But this is also open to industry partners. So if you've got um, needs for either training events or you want to plan events, um, within your own organization or host other types of events, we have that um, facility here. We're also working on some collaborative work in this area uh, with GRCC, um, sponsoring some of the NSA, NSF um, proposals that they're pursuing there. And then there's K-12 outreach as well. Uh, some of our faculty, cybersecurity faculty, have gotten uh, funding from NSA and NSF to run a Gen, Gen Cyber camp this summer, which is basically a cybersecurity hands-on experience for high schoolers here in the region. And so uh, there's a big investment there that the university is making in cybersecurity. The other thing we're hearing a lot from industry, and all of us are, given the, the whole chat GPT conversation that started back in November, is what I call long tail AI. So companies like Google brought us AI. AI really, you know, it, it's been an academic discussion since the 1950s, but it's really with the advent of the web and big data and companies like, like Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and so forth. So the technology really happened in industry. And so when I, when I talk about long tail AI, a lot of the money that's been made is, is the tech giants, but that long tail is where we are in West Michigan and there's a lot of fantastic opportunities to insert these technologies in things that we do well already. So we have a number of initiatives, projects, industry sponsored projects in that area, um, including uh, an interaction with Procter & Gamble. We just did a study, published it last fall in an international conference with researchers at Procter & Gamble where we do an edge-based AI with acoustic data to help them do um, product discovery. Uh, we're working with Stacy and her team at Array of Engineers and, and, and Mike Ling on, on using conversational technologies to automate uh, software testing. And we've got numerous other conversations going with, with organizations in the region that are discovering that there's opportunities to take AI and insert it into their, their um, products and, and services. And then lastly, we're also working with some of the larger companies, including Apple and, and Amazon, to explore ways to get some of their technologies, not just here in our curriculum and in the industry, in the educational environment here, but how can we create, as a platform, how can we provide training and, and access to these technologies to people, to the public in general? So um, actually we're partnering with some tech council members and Amazon directly, to launch a series of in, in Amazon instructor-led uh, cloud computing uh, one-day training um, 
opportunities on various Amazon technologies. And that, that's going to start in May. You'll, in this facility here again, you'll, you'll see those advertised uh, shortly if you're interested. So that's a quick sampling of a number of different things we're doing with our industry partners. Right. Thank you, Jonathan. And if you've not read Crane's Grand Rapids, uh, they just launched yesterday. And uh, the two, the first two articles that came out were about Grand Valley and all of the cool things happening. So super excited to see that. Um, so Bobby, my next question is for you. Um, as we push towards becoming this innovative hub of the Midwest, bringing, creating that container where those thought leaders come together and kind of talk about the next best product or knowledge spillover or all that great st stuff is going to be super important. I know we talked about in our tech strategy a little bit about the center. I wonder if you talk a little bit about what's happening with that. Well, just within the past couple of weeks, um, some, some of the faculty led by Dr. Molly Cooper uh, have been working uh, and they're going to be part of the Center for Virtual Learning. But they're working on a really interesting, innovative project uh, with NSA, and that is to launch satellites uh, into space uh, and uh, ultimately to bring cybersecurity uh, into space uh, to protect us uh, in space uh, with cybersecurity breaches. Uh, it's phenomenal work, uh, and it's work that ultimately we're going to bring back into our curriculum. Uh, our cybersecurity program is the 17th ranked cybersecurity program in the entire United States. Uh, the leadership, uh, Dr. Greg Godwin, uh, Dr. Jerry Emmerich, uh, is just phenomenal. Uh, and some of the things that they're doing, they have uh, a lot of them I, I don't know about because they're top secret, uh, but at the same time uh, work with uh, the Michigan Attorney General, uh, the NSA, uh, with uh, corporations, uh, and also working together with K through 12 to offer dual enrollment opportunities, most notably in the Rockford Public Schools, uh, where uh, we bring cybersecurity into K through 12, because that's such an important part of the foundational curriculum, regardless of what somebody goes and, and ultimately winds up studying, because we all need to know about cybersecurity uh, and how to pre prevent against attacks. Yeah, great. Thank you, Bobby. So, Brad, my next question is for you. Um, so when we launched our original tech strategy, we did a, a few case studies. I talked about that of cities that were similar. Uh, one of them was in um, Waterloo, Canada. And um, at the University of Waterloo, they have an innovation center that hosts, at any given point, 400 technology companies. It'll spin out 5,000 you know, technologists in any given year. Um, so Rob, you are a founder. You've founded, you know, a co couple different companies. Can you talk about, you know, that journey and, you know, what do you see as kind of our opportunities or our gaps here in West Michigan for founders and how do we elevate that community? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first, so yeah, I was a founder. Uh, um, the company I'm thinking about right now where I had a choice in terms of like which city I wanted to go into was a, a mobile communications startup. It was venture-backed. I had just raised my first round of capital, so seven years ago, and I had a choice between four different cities. And I was really trying to think like, okay, so where am I going to plant myself to actually expand this business? There's really three key things that I was thinking about when I was going through that process. One was that I need to have flexibility in space. So I really wanted to grow my team where I was. So I was really looking for places that had you know, expandable workspace, you know, pay per desk type of deal, make it really in, uh, easy to expand and maybe even contract if I, if I needed to. Uh, the next was to, uh, the network was extremely uh, important to me. In terms of the peers, were there other startup founders? Uh, were there other people that were in that domain that I can communicate with and kind of ping ideas and grow? And then there was also uh, in mentors, I was thinking about that. Uh, and uh, also looking for investments, for example. Can I network with investors? Can I 
get an investment, you know, assuming this thing's getting off the ground. Uh, and then, <clears throat> last thing I'll mention, the third component, which is really important, was, uh, I called it disaster recovery. So knowing that startups typically fail, uh, I was really thinking ahead of time, you know, in terms of like, if this thing were to crash and burn, what is my next thing? What am I gonna do? So the ecosystem that I've been moving into was extremely important. Uh, and I wanted to plant roots in a place that where the network that I had built, I could actually expand upon from that point. So um, in, in terms of like where we're at today versus seven years ago, seven years ago I chose to stay in DC. That was the easier bet for me. There was a lot of infrastructure there. But today, I would choose Grand Rapids uh, because of the community here, how collaborative we are here. It's, it is unique to Grand Rapids in terms of like how well we work together. So uh, I'm very happy that you know, we're, we're building this, this ecosystem, this tech hub, this Midwest you know, uh, entity uh, you know, together. That's great, thanks. I'm gonna add on to that question. So we talk a lot about um, being this humble community. So West Michigan is a very humble community, right? We go to work, we do our jobs, and then, uh, and then we go home and spend time with our families, and we never really talk about, or not enough, the great work that we're doing here. And so in that vein, what, what is from, now put on your RPI hat, right, from an economic development perspective, knowing that you've been a founder, what, what can we do to elevate the great work and the uh, capacity and the capabilities of our companies here? What are we doing to that end? Uh, I'd say continue to do what we're best at and it's collaborate. So we have the Tech Council of West Michigan, very engaged you know, community of businesses. And when we go out to places like Silicon Valley or we go out to uh, South by Southwest over in Austin or we go to CES over in Las Vegas, what we're finding is that businesses in our community are going with us. Uh, they are getting business. We're helping them connect them with businesses. They're connecting us with businesses that might be interested in doing, you know, their uh, thing here in the greater Grand Rapids area. So I, I feel like more collaboration needs to continue, and we also need to look for uh, more investors, more mm -hmm. mentoring programs. And I know we're all working on those things. So yeah. very happy to be engaged in those initiatives. Yeah, great. Thanks. So I really have the best job in the world, right? I get paid to go out and talk to some pretty amazing people all over the world and, and talk about the technology and the things that they're doing and then show up West Michigan, right? So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a story. So Jonathan connected me with a, a, a technologist, a gentleman that owned a um, software company in Columbia. And he and his wife um, during COVID finally got to the point where they're like, you know, we're just, we're tired of traveling, we want to move someplace with our children, settle roots. Um, and so they chose uh, Grand Rapids, West Michigan. And so then Jonathan made the introduction and we spent some time kind of talking about, you know, what his desires and his needs are kind of here. And it dawned on me that, you know, Technology is one thing, and getting connected and helping them move their product along was one thing, but really the relationship, the networking side, um, was, was just as important to him. So Jonathan, to that end, I know that you are doing that with not just this particular young man, but, but other founders and technologists that are coming in from all over the country. Can you talk a little bit more about how you're trying to get them engaged? Sure, yeah. It's interesting listening to Rob and then you brought up the Alejo Montoya, yeah. our, our mutual friend. Um, I'm glad actually, that you said his name because I would have pushed it. Yeah, yeah, a fantastic uh, person, a great, great entrepreneur too. But, but listening to Rob's story, when I met Stacy a couple years ago via the Tech Council, um, I think her story was very similar. So Stacy came to Grand Rapids and founded Array of Engineers, and I, I bring up Array of Engineers again because I think they're sort of the poster child for what it looks like for a smaller organization, a younger organization, to collaborate with the university. By the time I met Stacy and her team, they were already involved in our School of Engineering co-op program. They very quickly jumped onto our sponsor, uh, senior project sponsorship opportunity, which basically gives the company the opportunity to sort of own three seniors for 15 weeks and have them work on a custom software deliverable um, that's aligned with whatever interests they have. And so I think after our initial conversation, Mike sent a proposal and we were doing one of those in weeks. 
But more interestingly, last year, um, with Array of Engineers, we launched a collaboration involving Dr. Rahat Rafiq, who is an AI expert, conversational technologies in particular. And so Mike and Rahat have been using these technologies in the area of software test. And with, with a degree of success, there's, I think there's some papers in the, in the pipeline um, being, being presented at some industry forum uh, venues. But more importantly, and this, this gets back to the small company and the opportunity, Mike and Rahat recently put together an S for Grant application, and now they're going to expand the collaboration um, and, and, and get some government money to help with that. So that's a fantastic way for founders and small organizations to come to the university, leverage the talent we have here, and together um, obtain some of that resource that can be used to um, you know, expand your business. But the other side of that, and this is what I know from my conversations with Stacy that she understands very well, is the impact you're having on the learners. So on the projects that Array of Engineers engage for this on, we have undergraduates, both in the co-op programs as well as the sponsored senior projects, multiple gra uh, undergraduates. But on the research project, we have um, international graduate students that we've recruited to West Michigan using the funding Stacy is providing us. And this is world-class talent, right? And so they're actually getting exposed to our company. What Stella brought up in the previous panel is very, very real. There's a huge ROI here. And these international students, a lot of them, I hate to say it, with the exceptions of Stacy and her company, a lot of them are going to California and to big tech. Most of those would stay here if they had that relationship and opportunity with our industry here. The other thing Array of Engineers is very involved in is K-12 uh, STEM outreach, right? So they recognize you know, the relationship with their talent doesn't start at the career fair at the university when the student's gonna graduate in another month. No, it actually starts, the investment starts at K-12, right? So we have to have this holistic involvement of our industry partners. And the university, of course, um, helps facilitate some of that STEM outreach as well. Thanks, Jonathan. And I know Ferris is doing some amazing things, too. Yeah, to build on what uh, Jonathan's saying with regard to K-12, one of the things that really concerns us at Ferris State University is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and uh, the reality <coughs> that certain uh, school districts are not uh, receiving the same sort of uh, training vis-a-vis uh, -vis innovation and technology uh, that others might be receiving with higher tax bases. Uh, so what we've done is we've worked uh, together uh, across uh, different colleges at the university and we received a $670,000 USDA grant uh, which allows us uh, to extend uh, the digital footprint of Ferris State University, but more importantly, taking to rural districts, underserved districts, um, the same opportunities that better funded districts have so we don't create this digital divide that we're in danger of creating when we're just focusing uh, on, um, on certain areas uh, that are only going to get richer uh, as and leaving other areas behind. Uh, and in particular, we focused on STEM courses and delivering STEM courses or STEM-related courses to rural uh, Michigan districts and giving those kids a chance to have uh, the same opportunities that other students in better-funded districts have. Uh, it's something that uh, is exciting. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to, uh, for our faculty, our students, to work together with K through 12 students uh, who otherwise might not have a chance to go to college. 
uh, and um, it, it's 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 really really exciting. And we're also working on uh, and have brought in certificates uh, for HVAC uh, and for uh, electric vehicles uh, to give stu uh, high school students an opportunity who might not be going to college uh, or hadn't thought about going to college to take 34 credits uh, that will prepare them for the workforce uh, in electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, as well as uh, in HVAC and in other areas. That's great, thank you. And I, one of the things that we did with the tech strategy quite a while ago is we convened a subcommittee uh, of the council that is now going out and meeting with um, our K through 12 schools, helping them re-envision some of the programs that, that they have. Um, East Kentwood was one of the first schools that we started to work with, and they are taking a second look at their summer school program and using that as a possible opportunity to um, create awareness around technology and the um, jobs of the, of the future. So I think that'll be, thank you both, that'll be super important going forward. So I want to switch over to, uh, to business growth, um, which is kind of the last leg of the tech strategy in, in an area that, that we really um, excel in at the right place. You know, helping our companies here, as well as those that are looking at West Michigan as a place to, to grow and bring their, bring their, uh, their talent to. Um, so in West Michigan, in Michigan, I always say we are a community of makers, right? We're founded on making things, kind of the first Silicon Valley of the car industry. So if you think about um, still the, the density that we have in that maker space, and then creating this, you know, digital first economy uh, within the manufacturing space. My first question goes to Dan. So. Dan, you and I talk about this a lot, right? Like, what is the sweet spot for West Michigan as far as becoming this digital first economy um, and being in this makerspace? So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. I think it, it's, I think, an exciting opportunity. I, when I look at what I know about Michigan and what I see happening in the world, there's, there's this, um, there's this plateau moment that's coming at us quickly where the, lots of people make software in the world. You're not competing with Silicon Valley, you're competing with Sweden and India and Poland and Thailand. And, and making software is accessible to lots and lots of people. You can do it on a phone and that's it, with a one person startup. Um, making something that has sensors on it, that moves and has machines and interacts with other things is massively harder. And doing that takes mechanical engineering talent, it takes um, software talent, it takes partnership and manufacturing partnerships. There isn't a state that's better at all three of those things than Michigan. Like as we start seeing more things, like I, in my house I have a smart vacuum cleaner and everything else is done, right? But there's an opportunity to have things like I, uh, today's trash day, my, Trash is gonna be stuck in the garage because I'm not there to take it to the curb. How do I not have a smart trash can that can just make its way to my driveway? Like, there will be things like that that are getting made in the next 15 years and Michigan has an opportunity to own that space. Like, there isn't a place that, um, that has better opportunity to tackle that than, than Michigan. Yeah. Thank you. And we talked a little bit, I'm going to dovetail on that, we talked a little bit about this amazing design community that we have here in West Michigan, too, and how maybe that's kind of the short-term opportunity for us as far as growth and then, you know, getting into the others. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think in, on the software side of things, the, the amount of time between design and build is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. In some cases, people are skipping over the design part and the engineer is just designing as they build and they see if it works and if it doesn't, they do it over. When you're building things that are more sophisticated, like cars, mm -hmm. right, or um, uh, office chairs, or anything where the, the manufacturing process is, is longer, and so the amount of thinking you have to put into design 
is more important. Because if you design something and then create the partnership network and get it into the factory and set it, create the line and figure out how you're going to distribute it and your design is wrong, then you have to start over again. And so that's created a really, really interesting um, 3D and mechanical design strength mm -hmm. in the community here that I think has a lot of potential as systems continue to get more complex and more technology. Yeah, great, thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I could add yeah, to that. Go ahead, you, you know, thinking of, you know, West Michigan, or the region, really, the whole state being sort of this maker space, and especially with automotive. Yeah. Um, and so to think about these trending technologies and sort of how they map onto our unique ecosystem. And that's where, I think that's what Dan's talking about. There's huge opportunities there. So MEDC, 11 years ago, kicked off a cyber challenge for automotive. And what this is, is an event where they get automotive manufacturers or any of the first, second tier suppliers that build components into that space. Companies bring their products in. They, they have a number of white hat hacker, you know, celebrities, people that really know this stuff and will come in. The participants are going to, the companies bring the products, like actual products. Uh, college students and high school students who are interested in cyber or think they might be interested in cyber come in, they attend this instructional phase, and then after they spend a number of days learning techniques, they turn them loose on these products mm -hmm. and they hack them. Mm -hmm. right? And these have been wildly successful in the automotive space. And so next summer, we're, we're actually working with MEDC right now, they want to do this in healthcare and medical devices. Again, we've got a lot of that going on here, but companies will be coming from all over the world, bringing products in, and we're gonna host that here at Grand Valley with MEDC so that students from all over can come in, experience and learn about this field, but then we actually have them turn loose on these products. So everybody wins, right? More people get interested in the talent, or in, in the uh, space, companies, they actually, everything's proprietary, they don't announce what they find, but companies find it really valuable too because they find out they've got a lot of back doors and things they, they didn't know about. So there, this is an example, again, of what Dan was saying about, we've got this unique economy, this, the, our legacies are very rich and, and, and very valuable. If we take some of these training technologies and map them on there and really explore that space, it, it's really an amazing opportunity. Yeah, that's great. Rob, I see you writing feverishly. Did you want to add? Oh yeah, I just mentioned one thing quickly. So I, I really think it's important for us to kind of really think about our, our city and our region competitively against others. So we probably shouldn't compete in areas where we don't have a strategic advantage. So one of those strategic advantages we have here to the point that everybody's making is that we have a rich history in manufacturing. So leveraging advanced manufacturing and mixing those with uh, other emerging technologies we're looking to work on here in the region. For example, health sciences. <coughs> you know, that was a, you know, we have the medical mile, and then when you mix health sciences with uh, advanced manufacturing, you get like 3D additive uh, medical devices, which we have startups actually in the region doing. Uh, and then we also have technology coming into play with the digital aspects, so mix, mix digital with uh, manufacturing, and you get a whole new area of innovation and ways that we can compete uh, globally. Uh, and I, I think that's really how we compete to win. Yeah, great, thanks Rob, great point. So to that point, you know, when we did uh, our initial launch, uh, we did a host of surveys out to local business and community leaders. 50% of businesses said that they would definitely need to reskill their talent in order to become this digital first economy. And 75% believed that they were not ready. And so to that end, Bobby, I think about Ferris Kendall and the amount of design expertise and all of the design people that come out of Kendall alone. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, uh, you just have to go as far as Banff uh, and see some of the great work that uh, Kendall uh, College of Art and Design alums have done in designing a really high-tech uh, space uh, for solving problems uh, and addressing uh, cancer in particular. 
uh, and we take a look at design when we with Jonathan and our colleagues, we've had a lot of conversations about design and what is design because there's so many different aspects of design, whether it's product design, uh, design thinking, uh, whether it's in the tech space, whether it's in the real space. Uh, design is, uh, is a concept that depending upon the, con the context in which it's used can mean a variety of different things. For example, under Jonathan's leadership, working together with our College of Pharmacy and uh, our College of Business, some faculty members, uh, they designed a pharmacy uh, that uh, had better workflow processes uh, that and addressed some of the issues that you have when you go into a pharmacy and you look and you're order, ordering whatever it is that you're getting and you're going through the different bags and so how do you spell your last name? Is that what you see? Um, and uh, you know, there's, there, there are opportunities there. If we come back to MEDC and their support uh, of technology, uh, the $3.2 million grant that they recently awarded Ferris State University uh, to focus on electric vehicle uh, batteries, li lithium ion battery production and research, uh, the state is willing to support, and that it goes to what my colleagues uh, here are saying, is that Michigan is the place, uh, and it's climactically a lot better than most of the rest of the United States, even though this week, notwithstanding, uh, <laughs> with, the, with the climate, but you know, at the same time, uh, this is a great place. I was away from Michigan for many years uh, and came back here uh, purposefully uh, because it's such a great place uh, to live, uh, to work, and to play. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and then being on the top of so many wonderful, innovative uh, thinkers uh, and doers, not just thinkers, but doers, is really exciting. Bobby's going to be on the next Pure Michigan commercial. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great lead in to the final question for today, which I want everybody to, to talk a little bit about. So the title of this session is Opportunities and Stories that We Can Learn From that have happened all over the world, all over the country. So from each one of your perspectives, I know you're all well-traveled, uh, can you talk about one or two things that you've seen that have worked in other parts of our, our world uh, that you would like to see here? We can start with you, Dan. Sure. Um, I think that one of the fundamental things I believe is that we all, every one of us, everyone on our team has to be continuously learning. The world is changing around us all the time and we need continuous education programs for adults, we need, you know, better STEM education things for, for younger people. Uh, but all of us have the responsibility to be continuously learning. And so one of the things that I, Silicon Valley, I think, did really well is there was a, there was just always, every week, there was some meetup somewhere where I could just go and listen to somebody at Dropbox tell a story about how they do things at Dropbox. Or um, somebody from, from, from Facebook, like way, way back when it was, um, earlier in its life. Hearing those stories of other people being successful at the thing they're trying to do that you're about to try to do is really, really helpful. And so I think we need education processes that look very small sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not a six week program, but just like a two hour thing, like this. Yeah. Right? There should be more stuff like this. Yeah. That's great, thanks. Now, I'll just add a quick plug. So we did, last year, started off our Founders series. So these are happy hours where we bring founders together, not just from West Michigan, but all over the world, can talk about how they walked the journey successfully. Our next one will be on May 18th, and it is a woman-led panel. So women founders in West Michigan are all over talking about their journey. So I hope you can all join us. Thank you. Jonathan. So, you know, I think in the tech economy, the, the most important important asset, I mean, it's prerequisite, is a critical mass of talent, right? And so often when we think of tech, we think of innovating in tech. But what Dan just mentioned is really innovating in education, 
And I think that's what we have to learn how to do, and we have to do it more. Our legacy ways of educating don't always fit in a rapidly changing world. So can I tell three quick stories? You sure can. <laughs> so, so Paul Doyle and I, we were in the fifth floor last July, I think. We walk into this building, and when you came in this morning, you, you probably saw the signage for this event. And we saw developers then coding camp. And we're like, what? What is this? We're like the computing guys here. We don't know anything about it. <laughs> so we, we sort of like snuck in the room. And it's this high schooler teaching 50 other high schoolers how to code. A high schooler, 12th grader with his eighth grade brother. So Vishnu Maino, some of you Vishnu, might know. Yeah. Vishnu is like getting to be a, ce a celebrity here with his uh, yeah. winning pitch comp. He's got his own LLC. Oh, yeah. But it was really remarkable because they were, him and his brother were incredibly effective at teaching their peers how to code. And so we dragged them upstairs after the event and got to know them a little bit. And we found out they've been doing this kind of stuff since they were in fifth grade, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So we actually got very close with Vishnu. He's been dual enrolled this past year. He's actually, uh, Zach DeBrine, mm -hmm. who's doing biometric high performance machine learning algorithm. Vishnu's been working with him oh, cool. as a high school student, dual enrolled. Um, but the other thing we've done is we've introduced Vishnu to our MI STEM group, also hosted here at Grand, Grand Valley. And they're hoping to present what Vishnu's been doing at TeacherCon this summer, which is where all kinds of K-12 teachers come to learn about innovating in education. So I'm pointing this out because here is some organic growth. This is this is our community to responding to the need, despite us leaders and educators, right? It's happening. So imagine if we, when we see this happening, if we actually create a platform where we can stand this up and get all the K-12 peers teaching each other. So that's story number one. Story number two, during COVID, um, Steve Hodas, one of our colleagues here at, at Grand Valley, very innovative man, um, created what's called the K-12 connect and it's really a brilliant idea it's using technology in education but what he's done is he's created a network of over a thousand tutors who are basically college students and a bunch of them here from Grand Valley and, and other institutions around the country and they've they've got this network and it's it's all online where high schoolers in stem having needing a tutor in a stem discipline can go on this website sign up and basically have a college student who's studying in STEM, STEM disciplines tutor them in whatever science, math, and whatever classes they're working at. So this started during COVID, but now it's got a life of its own. There was a press release last week about this. Um, and now there are thousands of kids all over the state of Michigan that have one-on-one -on -one tutors who are actually college students, some volunteered, some being paid, uh, but it's this really interesting thing where we're leveraging our college students to help us inspire and, and tutor and, and help K-12 students actually grow in these disciplines. The last example I want to mention is um, one our president actually launched here at Grand Valley. Um, so it's called REP4, so R-E-P-4, go out and Google it. Um, but it stands for Rapid Engineering Proto Rapid Education Prototyping. And so Philly Mantella is looking at all that, she's the president of the university, she's looking at all the barriers and constraints in higher ed today and, and trying to create value and make it relevant. And so what she's created, it's, it's actually a consortium of universities that are participating, but they take the learners, they, they convene a bunch of learners and they brainstorm on what are the problems in your educational pathway that you perceive are preventing you from making progress or going down the pathway you want to go and so forth. Then after they've discussed this, they start to brainstorm in the solution space. And then the student team to actually build out solutions. Some of, some of them are technology, some are, are not technology, but the idea is you engage the customer, which is actually the learner, in the process of innovating around education. So take a look at that. I think it's amazing uh, work. But this is what I think we need to do as, as educators in particular. We need to really be innovative in how we rise to meet the need that we have if we're going to grow our regional tech healthier. That's great. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, I guess I'll go. 
Um, so I'd say as a region, like um, in the Midwest, I think is more of a culture of kind of thinking being risk adverse. You know, the idea of taking risks, starting a new business, throwing capital at something that may not succeed. I think we need to embrace risk a bit more and then also kind of enjoy in the creative process in terms of creative destruction. Because you're gonna have companies that come up and then crash and then you're gonna have uh, some people, you know, you know, founders, they typically don't have a success until like their fifth company. So we have to really embrace the idea that we understand there's a process to this, there's gonna be a lot of destruction, but what comes out of it is beautiful things that really help advance the, the overall economy. Thanks, Rob. Bobby? Well, you know, I think we, uh, at the, the university level, uh, have to take a hard look at, uh, at how we deliver content. Uh, and we have to take a hard look at people's lives uh, from the traditional student to the non-traditional student. And we have, to, we have to ask ourselves whether we're serving uh, these students, all different types of students, diverse students, internationally and domestically diverse students, uh, whether we're serving their needs uh, in terms of workforce development, in terms of preparing them for the workforce uh, and making the investment that they make in higher education worth it. Uh, and uh, that might mean that uh, we're not uh, teaching classes on the schedules that fit us, uh, but schedules rather that fit uh, students. Uh, and uh, being creative with uh, something that we've learned uh, through COVID, uh, hybrid and uh, remote delivery, uh, using Zoom and other uh, and Teams and other uh, delivery modes to be able to reach students where they are, not where we think they should be. Uh, and that really, uh, together with maybe not a full college degree, maybe certificates that just get students prepared to go into the workforce, and then as they go along with industry and partnerships, uh, supporting the advanced knowledge and what they need along the way as opposed to what we think they need. But really coming closer together uh, with industry with regard to the skills and the competencies that our graduates uh, will need. And you know, if there's a story from another place that I saw that, uh, that I'd like to bring here, uh, that's uh, travels that I had through uh, the Netherlands. And they ha had in one room a lecture uh, and in the hallway different stations for students to discuss what was going on in the lecture. And the students were free to come and go from the lecture uh, and, uh, and discuss what was going on inside the lecture and the professor uh, was, was playing to that within that context. I think we have to look at, uh, uh, at all things considered, uh, and we have to look at the reality of the world, especially post-COVID, uh, because it's not the same. Uh, students that are coming out of high school uh, haven't uh, had a traditional high school experience like all of us know, uh, the traditional high school experience. Uh, and they're not accustomed to sitting still in a classroom and learning the way that it was perhaps before COVID. Agreed. Thanks, Bobby. Well, so I think now is a good time to engage the audience and see if we have any questions. So there's mention of continuous learning as well as how uh, different methods of delivery for learning. Um, I'm curious for myself as um, a kind of lifetime learner. Past 20 years, I've been in college for half my life. And night classes and things like that serve me well, but I'm kind of to the point where I'm a bit over being graded and going to normal lectures and things like that. So is there consideration with continued learning, similar to like Udemy courses or things like that, where the university can provide graduate studies and learning to people who have 
graduated but want to continue with that learning. Yeah, any Jonathan or Bobby? Yeah, this is, uh, this is something that we're looking at uh, and that's engaging our alums, but not only engaging our alums, reaching down, taking a look at who started with us uh, and what happened to them. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and finding where they are and if we can re-engage them uh, to learn more about how we can advance their lives and their careers. But that's certainly something uh, that uh, I know GVSU is also working together with the company as is Saginaw. Uh, Eastern Michigan had a lot of success uh, and there are a million residents of the state of Michigan that started college, uh, either at the community college level or at the university level, uh, and did not finish. So those are the people out there together with our alums uh, and looking at where they work and whether there would be that support. We're doing that in uh, partnerships uh, that with uh, GRCC uh, and looking at, uh, in particular, uh, we're focused now on nursing uh, and the RN to BSN to MSN to DNP, Doctor of Nursing Practitioner, uh, degrees and how we can all work together so those students can be supported uh, by a healthcare system while they're working there and also perhaps serving as clinical site supervisors uh, and advancing their careers, but I'd like to take that model uh, beyond uh, nursing and uh, the healthcare professions. Great, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, if I could respond to that, Mike, we are definitely having a lot of conversations at Grand Valley about that. In fact, the the uh, the one day session coming up with Amazon in, in May is sort of one of our experiments in this area. So that's going to be a one day. Uh, an Amazon instructor is going to lead it, and it's going to be build out a conversational technology using Amazon and Black. So it's very focused, but it's perfect for somebody who's a developer and maybe needs to build a conversational interface and wants to come in and learn how to leverage a platform. So that's one of a number of experiments we hope to do. The press release that, or the Crane Business article that ran this week that Jen opened or talked about is a project at Grand Valley called Blue Dot. And so the plan is to renovate the Everhart Center. It's a, 